Um, shall we begin? Go on. Yeah, Sean. Whakataka te hau ki te uru. Whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā taratara ki tai. E hia ke ane te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, tihei mauri ora. And um, what a baby, Ip Milati. Munamale, this is Nisu Savon. Molenechi bel sap ni las. Yalan me de Orlando le sogas. Er no mus gitu ipnil, yal muveki, ni let siam abdilis. Moe fortito vadrasi barkatan vuesta mi burdi to si dilemma, gitu ipnat ipnil. Chimiguetchke chimani do, mawaji and azu kanechi gain in dijna cause. Nin sami and Irish, kitchener on dayan. Chimiguetch nin in adizawin. Wadozum nin gweko bamatsuan, chimigwech gichimani do. And I give thanks to the Creator for my life, for all that is in creation, for teaching me about how we are all created in the circle of life. I often think about all my relations, and no being is left out of that. I think about the standing people, that's the trees, the plant people the winged ones, the creepers, the crawlers, the flyers, the swimmers, the sky people, the star people, the grandfather sun who lights our day, even on a rainy day, grandmother moon who shines at night, father sky and our first mother, mother earth who provides for all, all the beings. And um, so I give thanks for those teachings. Uh, an honor to be here with uh, the five of you. Um, I'm, we're going to each introduce ourselves um, to, to begin. Nga toki matwaru a rata ko aotea ko taki tumu o ku waka, ko tarifa rata ko taranaki ko tamatia o ku maunga, ko mana moka rata ko taipora enui ko te feke o ku whenua. Iwi o tau nei i tēnei rā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. And my name is uh, Tioti Rākena. Um, I work on the Faculty of Creative Arts and Industries at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, or in our, in our language we say Aotearoa or Nui Tireni. Um, my, my day job is uh, teaching classical voice in the School of Music, uh, a school of music based on the traditions of Western Europe. However, I am Māori, and we are Polynesian mariners who, who migrated across the South Pacific to New Zealand before colonization by the British. And, and implicit within that label is an understanding that I belong to an indigenous um, collective that has, a, like so many, a complicated colonial history, but specific to our context. So I'm here on this panel and I occupy spaces internationally and globally often in the music education world because as a part of that community, um, I have an obligation and responsibility to tell our stories and participate in discussions that may bridge gaps and perceptions and understandings of non-Western ways of thinking. So kia ora to everyone and thank you for the opportunity. Greetings, everyone. So I'm Kelly Lorla, and I'm a lecturer at uh, Wilfrid Laurier University and the University of Waterloo in uh, Waterloo in Kitchener, Ontario, Canada. And I grew up in uh, Northern Ontario, was born there on Treaty 61 territory, which is land of the Anishinaabe and Cree peoples, over 93,000 kilometers uh, worth of land and over 24 Indigenous communities. My grandfather is Sami and from Northern Finland. And uh, he came over in the 1920s and settled in Northern Ontario. So I recognize that um, he was colonized in his home country, but came to Canada and he's part, he was part of the colonizing project because he settled on indigenous territories, the land stolen from indigenous peoples. And now I live in Southern Ontario 
and the Haldeman Track Treaty, where the Haudenosaunee people only have 4.9% of their original territories. So I recognize um, I am living on stolen land and I am a colonizer, um, settler, as well as I'm colonized Indigenous because of my Sami Indigenous settler heritage. It's, it's a conflicting place to be sometimes, but that, that is who I am. Miigwech. Hi everybody, my name is Nikki Kazamzade, or Nicole as my screen says. I um, am uh, of English, Irish, and Scottish heritage. My paternal grandfather was the first in his family from to be born here from England. And um, the rest of my family are third or fourth generation from England or from Ireland and Scotland. I'm um, an elementary music teacher. I teach grades, well, kindergarten to grade six music here in Waterloo, Ontario. And I just completed my master's at um, Wilfrid Laurier University where Deanna and Gerard were both my professors. And um, uh, that's kind of where I'm coming from here, but I'm um, also continuing to do some research at Laurier because I, um, and really interested and passionate about community music and also music education and that changing the need for change, like enormous change within those fields. Well, my name is Gerard Young and I'm, um, as Nikki and Deanna have indicated and Kelly that I'm in Waterloo, Ontario and have had the opportunity and pleasure and honor of working with these people um, with some pretty important things. Um, I'm originally from California. I'm California Chinese American and on my mother's side Jamaican Chinese so with the Caribbean background and also besides having formal training through a doctoral degree in uh, Western music and conducting um, I've been traditionally trained in several uh, several types of music especially um, in um, Zen Buddhist Shakuhachi uh, Japanese music. I serve as an assistant professor in community music at Wilfrid Laurier University in Canada. I'm Gillian Howell. I'm one of the CMA commissioners um, and I work as a research fellow at the Faculty of Fine Arts and Music at the University of Melbourne. And I live in the city of Melbourne or its traditional indigenous name, local name is Nam. Um, and I live and work and was born on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. Um, and in Australia, the um, traditional owners, uh, there is no treaty with the traditional owners. So this is um, a stolen land that was never ceded. Um, my family heritage is British, Irish. I'm a first generation Australian. My parents immigrated here in the 1960s. Um, both of them were born in World War II London um, and were eager to escape, I imagine, the sort of grey austerity of post-war recovery there. Um, and my mother always talks about her love of Neville Shute novels and that was what brought her, wanted, made her want to travel to Australia, Neville Shute. Um, I've been working in community music for, I, I, get, I think most of my music career actually. And um, I've always been interested in the power dynamics of music, uh, community music and community music leadership and that relationship between music leaders uh, or community musicians and communities. Um, often in my work, I'm working in communities that I'm not I'm automatically a member of. So it's been a question that's really um, challenged me and fascinated me for a long time. So. Me, I'm Deanna Yerachuk. Uh, I am also in the Waterloo region along with uh, Kelly and Nikki and Gerard, also at uh, Wilfrid Laurier uh, in community music. Um, my my uh, ancestral background is uh, my father is Ukrainian. Uh, that's where Yerachuk comes from. Um, and his, his grandparents uh, immigrated to uh, Western Canada, to Alberta in the early 1900s. Um, and uh, my mom is Scottish, Irish uh, in, um, in Ontario along the St. Lawrence River, which is known as loyalist country. Uh, this practice of locating ourselves is a new practice for those of us who are white or new, it's newer for me. Um, and, uh, and the idea of cultural humility, which is in the title of this presentation, um, that that strikes me as um, an instruction for uh, white folks um, in terms of, uh, you know, about how do we make sure we are keeping ourselves accountable? How do we reflect and really think about power and privilege? How do we think not only of our own personal relationships, but also how do we um, fight to mitigate the systems that structure 
uh, injustice, uh, particularly with um, with colonized, uh, so uh, black communities with uh, indigenous communities. Um, so cultural humility, I feel like means something to a specific group of people and is speaking to a specific group of people. So um, I'm aware of that. And I, I think um, in this, the work that we're doing here, I think really we wanna be naming um, colonization uh, and we wanna be naming white supremacy and racism as, as ideas that uh, structure our experiences um, and structure um, uh, the community music as a field of practice and as a field of scholarship. Maybe at this point, I'll turn it over to Teoti and, and Kelly. For me, understanding the nature of, of collective identity is central to understanding how Indigenous communities interact and build relationships. And um, when I'm asked to participate in anything or do anything in the arts community or in my university position, my reaction is, how will this impact my community? Will it lift my, my community? And I, I don't mean to romanticize that because I certainly consider like things like fiscal outcome and will it impact on my watching Netflix? You know, I do think of these other considerations, but um, I have learned a set of parallel values to the colonial model that shapes New Zealand mainstream culture. And it's a set of models that were modeled, a uh, set of values that were modeled by my elders. And to understand this collective identity is to understand the social, socio-political outcome of historical trauma in my context and how these things have shaped my collective's ideals and aspirations. So I connect that now just to my opening introduction uh, of myself when I located myself, um, and which was in the Māori language and was directed at my, trans, uh, my ancestors who have passed and other Māori who may be present in this environment because it establishes my genealogical relationship through physical landmarks, the canoes my descendants came on from the islands, the land they lived on, and the landmarks that are part of our tribal narrative. And this allows people to make connections to me or to my family or my wider community. And when this relationship is established, they can, we can reconcile any past histories that may need to be addressed. And when we've cleansed that space, then we can move on. And this is fundamental to many um, Pacific cultures. Um, we have some wonderful Pacific Island uh, researchers at my institution, Dr. Melanie and I, and they speak with various methodologies. And they speak to this notion as teu lava, which is cultivating or nurturing of the space between. And it refers to relationships and how the flourishing of each person is supported by the quality of that relationship and is a constant negotiation of that space between them. And I bring this up because we in New Zealand are at an interesting place in our journey to decolonization or negotiating that space between. In New Zealand, part of that is giving indigenous culture equal status with the settler culture. In New Zealand, we have Māori institutes of high learning called wānanga that provide higher education within an educational framework built around Māori aspirations, values, and cultural practices. And this allows us self-sovereignty and mitigates the need to negotiate space between cultures. And increasingly, there has been an interest in mainstream universities to integrate Māori music traditions and practices into our curriculum. So in considering this, and I've reflected on this quite a lot over the last few years, the role of Māori situated in mainstream universities, and there aren't that many of us, but we're there, it, it can be complicated. We understand the history of appropriation. We understand that indigenous community music making is often connected to community wellness, to life rituals, and other significant ceremonies and needs a specific framework to ensure all cultural protocols are met. We also need to look at the capacity of our staff to provide appropriate frameworks for the transmission of these traditions and consider the quality of the relational space between the School of Music and Māori communities. Enacting culturally responsive and appropriate learning practices can challenge and disrupt dominant ways of knowing music education. And I ask myself, is it worth the energy, psychological and otherwise, to support the cultural power through this type of epistemological shift? 
Um, I say that because I've been doing this for a long time and I'm quite tired. Um, and I, so I asked myself some questions. What is in it for my collective? How would this benefit my community? And the reality is that our language and practices are vulnerable through cultural suppression and language loss. And that is why community music making has been so crucial for my people. It has been a tool for a cultural revival, sustaining languages and music practices. Maybe we need to consider, meaning, meaning Māori, do we need the culture of power in order to revive and sustain our music traditions? I mean, it's an interesting question. Another question is, who become the knowledge bearers in times of historical trauma? Is it through a partnership between the settlers and through their higher learning inst institutions? Which is a really provocative question in my context. Is the space between our School of Music and Māori community musicians too cluttered with historic issues to build a strong partnership? Again, something to be considered. Is there still some cleansing of that space still to be done? So I leave you with those reflections, those provocations. Kia ora tata katoa, and I pass it on to Kelly. When I think about the space between, you know, when I first started my research and thought about doing a PhD in my later part of my life, I had seen many Google pictures of um, when I Googled indigenous protests, that's the words that the media uses, I would probably say land protector. Um, but Google would show these spaces where the indigenous person is, is right here and the military or the police officer is right there. And I started thinking about the space in between my hands or their faces was filled with so much animosity that they knew the other existed, but they didn't know really anything about the other. They just, but they acted as if they did know the other. And I'm probably thinking more so the police and the military and how, what they've learned in history. And so I wondered what the space would look like or feel like if they started to recognize each other. And so that was my research. And you know, a really interesting study that, that prompted me to create a lens in my research was done by Errol Berg and John Sloboda in 2010. And their title of their article was Music and Art in Conflict Transformation. And those authors, um, they looked at the audience impact of um, two adversarial singing groups singing together. And their research study found that the audience was not as optimistic about what was transpiring with the uh, singing partnership as the actual singing partnership members themselves. And so I became sparked by the idea of, well, what if we actually went on the enthusiasm of the partnership because they're believing that there's something there to be had. And so I turned my lens to look at the Indigenous women and girls and the police chorus who are white settler males singing together and what was happening over this five years. And so in that ethical space, you know, it was, um, I mean, it's, there's been thoughts of this kind of term as early as the 1970s and actually even um, earlier by Kierkegaard, but uh, Roger Poole kind of coined the term and Willie Ermine, who's a Cree educator, um, used that term in 2007 to talk about how Indigenous and settler peoples um, know each other exists, but they really don't know each other and how there's this undercurrent of animosity there that never gets addressed. So when our five, when our singing partnership had been happening for five years, it's like, what kept it together? And they talked about a genuine willingness um, to engage, that they knew there was something more than just an entertaining kind of partnership. It's like, yeah, I think I really want to learn something here. Or I want to know more. There was that. There was also, um, over time, a feeling of responsibility and accountability. Responsibility to show up, <laughs> 
to stay engaged and maybe to step out into some discomfort or do some homework on learning. And accountability too, recognizing that there, anybody's words and actions could hurt another. So they were accountable. And that, again, that had come out over, over five years of when I asked them, what do you think made this work? So it's quite telling. And I have to say it was song. It was, it was song. We loved, our drum circle loved singing, never thought we'd do it with the police. In fact, we wouldn't have engaged with the police with anything <laughs> um, if it, if, unless it was song. And even then I can say the women and girls were really reluctant um, in the beginning, but they said, well, if Kelly thinks it's a good idea, <laughs> all on my shoulders. So I was very cognizant that you know, there's been harm done there before, and uh, we didn't want that to happen in this group of men. And the last area is mutual reciprocity, is I realize settler peoples in partnerships have to do the greater work. And uh, that is what it is because the harm's been done by settler white people. And um, so, um, I think the police chorus recognized this and uh, they stepped up to do things. They, they did what they were asked and they did not take the lead. And, and then there were some other values that maintained this relationship. And so I'll just, I didn't plan this, but I guess when I look at the world from an indigenous perspective, I can't help but organize my research according to my worldview. I didn't know it was gonna happen this way. But it came out that it was the Anishinaabe seven teachings that there had to be a care or love for working with each other. And there had to be truth, which is truth of not denying the history and the colonization that's happened, even not denying the whiteness, the supremacy of whiteness that's there, being a settler and being honest um, with oneself about those things. And I'll tell you that was hard for the men who had never, they really didn't learn much in their schooling um, about Indigenous peoples. And also courage to step into the uncomfortable, to have respect, and then humility, which is not stepping up unless asked, um, because it's very common for the dominant white society to kind of take a lead on things or think that they may know how things need to go and the men recognize that they weren't taking the lead and wisdom is just really an accumulation of new knowledge that they were learning and which poked holes in the knowledge in the beginning because they admitted they did not know what the big deal was in this partnership and so it was only through our conversations, getting together for rehearsals that, um, that they started to, this learning process started to happen. Um, Kelly, I just wanted to jump right off of what you just said that you don't know what you don't know. Um, Kathleen Absalon has that right in her book and uh, she's got a book about indigenous, her indigenous methodology called How You Come to Know. I read it um, and it was pretty profound impactful for my own research. I worked with the Indigenous leads at our school board to run um, workshops for music educators to bring Indigenous perspectives into the classroom because a lot of music teachers were the only people in the school to teach everybody. I had built really strong and long-term relationships with the Indigenous leads because I'd been working really hard towards allyship with, um, with as an educator. And so based on that, we built these um, workshops, but the workshops were not the real learning, the really important stuff. And I think it was um, watching the educators in the workshops transform themselves. And every single one of those participants talked about the impact of the workshops on their own worldviews. And also every single one of them said almost exactly, I didn't know what I didn't know. In their, in their reflections. Um, and it was like, every time that I did an interview, that sentence gave me like just complete chills because that was exactly how I feel. Uh, um, like doing this work is uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable. It should be uncomfortable, right? Because as you said, like it's our job to do this work and it is uncomfortable because it's coming to realize that 
all the systems that are in place that I've, you know, oh yeah, I've hard work has got me, no, not just hard work. It's all the systems that are in place to lift me up and to make me have all the privilege that I do have. And um, so coming to reckon with all of that and then as an educator realizing that I am um, potentially upholding and continuing those systems and how do I break those down when I'm physically working in a colonial building, in a colonial system, in a colonial practice and everything I'm doing is in a colonial like physical space. And Nicole Robinson, the, the indigenous lead at our school board, she says, you can never decolonize education because it is a colonial construct, right? The whole thing, but you can de decolonize like thought processes and ways of being. And I think that the importance of being uncomfortable and never feeling like you've got it because you're always gonna be wrong. <laughs> and it's probably a sign that you need to do a lot more work. Um, I'm involved in a, a as a community musician working in a remote community in the northwest of Australia. So it's very, very, it's six hours flight from where I live. So it's, and then four hours drive inland. It's a long way. So I work a lot with um, young people in the school system, but I also work with ind Indigenous language teachers and we've been developing song, songs and songwriting um, and soundscape work over the last few years. And particularly in the last year, that work has really flourished, um, which has made me, you know, brought more attention and put more of a spotlight on how important those relationships are to me. I'm finding it really useful to think about thing, about relationality, but also about extractivist uh, mentalities. I'm very aware and very conscious of um, my country, Australia, has, has a long, deeply embedded culture of extraction. And we see it in our resource sector. We see it in the way that in the sorts of aid and, and support we offer to other countries in our region where we often support them too extract resources um, we are in, in it's a culture that is about discovery and extracting what it is that you need um, and that that is in a way it's admired it's it, there's a moral moral value attached to that because it supports efficiency and so we get we're so accustomed to working within these time frames and i feel very conscious of that when i um given the distance that i have from my participants or my collaborators, I think of them as my collaborators um, in this very far away township. Um, how can I be, how can I ensure that the relationships that I'm forming, I'm not forming in an extractivist way. I found it very, a very powerful word to have in my mind. And as a, a, in a way, as Nate asked us on Tuesday night um, to think about where our defaults are. Um, my defaults might often be around that sense of I want to honour this relationship and create space for these relationships and allow them to form in this organic way that they do form when I'm up there. But at the same time, I'm carrying um, the expectations of the organisation, the arts organisation that I work for, which is embedded within this larger structure system of, of grant proposals and letters of support and timelines and timeframes and deadlines and delivery and, and products and outputs and reporting back and describing and and doing that quickly uh, but it's an interesting space to be in as well because i'm the it, just as we ask our indigenous students or in, indigenous population to na be never constantly navigating this this white um settler world um and it being imposed upon them there's so there's a navigation of two worlds that's constantly being asked um to happen and i feel I can also feel myself in that um, discomfort of the two worlds and very willingly um, and welcoming its challenges and welcoming its lessons. Uh, but at the same time, very conscious that it's, there is a navigation and it's, there is a care, that I, a huge care that I want to take to protect those relationships above all else. Um, um, I wasn't truly racialized until I moved to Canada. I th and that just might be a matter of being confused, but um, it is a confusing place to be. So picking up both on Kelly's and Jillian's and, and Nikki's um, talk about education and these ways of thinking or cultures, cultures of extraction, cultures of reduction, right? Reductionist culture as well. And also the deconstructing culture that taking something apart, like someone's culture or someone's music, and then gluing it back together somehow helps you to understand it better. Which what we find is it really doesn't because everything's contextual, right? But we've gone through, I have gone through all of these processes 
um, in Western training and then in um, traditional training uh, in music in different cultural forms. And I do function quite a bit as um, an indigenous ally. And interestingly, as I analyze that, Kelly, and um, with the, in the different ways I've, uh, of allyship, I also have to function as an ally on the other sides too, of the extreme. And I don't know if it's the brown, the brownness or that people in their perception have to take a look at me and then push me to one side or the other. Are you this or are you that? I think it's, I think it's always negotiated with all, with similar experiences of settlers, shared experiences and shared experiences of people uh, migrating, forced migrations and similar experiences of people um, who've had land and property taken from them, uh, internment, that kind of thing. And there's tremendous cultural traumas um, within my background and um, that my elders, or my, uh, my parents and such, they just won't talk about and grandparents would not talk about. And so the in-betweens whether it's the Southeast Asians or whether it's the first wave of, of Chinese or, or Indians or however we divide them up, occupy this interesting place. And it's a huge majority place. Like they will be the biggest population in North America in a few years. What I think though, in an optimistic sort of way is, is allyship. Is that because of the shared experience um, on all of these different sides, is that the potential to to participate in allyship is very, very high amongst people who are in-betweens. Um, they, they can relate both ways, they can listen both ways, or I guess training and listening is sort of everything. And that's sort of the message I, I really wanted to work on. A lot of my work in this that I've come to with ethical space that I work with comes from Kelly and Willie Ehrman, um, also in um, a culture of hope, this radical center. It's the radical middle where all things exist, that's where the, the real activist has to live and not in the extreme. So I feel kind of kind of dumped there <laughs> and, and put there. And um, so I'm both a, I both share a lot of experiences as someone who has been colonized but also, and migrated, immigrant, but also, and settled, but also someone who has um, f functioned in that, in that colonized system pretty well for the most part. Well, I was just thinking, um, Gerard, it's so interesting. In New Zealand, the most common surname now is Singh. And the second most common surname is Lee, L-I. <laughs> so, you know, it was so interesting when you said that because I'm like going, hmm. And in our context, it's so interesting when we talk about these, um, you know, that we have a bicultural obligation, uh, the indigenous and the settler culture are the two that have shaped, that, that shape everything. But it's so interesting, the uptake in indigenous protocols and uh, has been most common, and I say this because my partner is American, amongst immigrants newer immigrants. It, they understand it, they get it, they come here and they join our history as complex as it is. And I'm going to use extractus. You can, we need to find the right word, Gillian, um, and, so, and write it somewhere so I can cite it. Um, because that's a great term that's really interesting. And even I, as a Maori researcher, I need to be careful that I don't conform to the Western paradigm and mm -hmm. accidentally start working in that manner because I think sometimes that can happen when we have objectives that are not defined by us. So. Just another thought I had about extractivist um, mentalities or, or mindsets is that often in um, devised music projects, we also go into those with an extractivist mindset, your participatory work in general. It's not unusual, uh, it's not ideal, mm -hmm. but it happens that you go into a, a community and you seek to take, to take things from that community that you can use in this music project. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we, we need to question those practices um, and especially if we, uh, if the project has already has this predetermined outcome. So One of the worst types I encounter is the type of person who wants to take something from a culture music and then claim, claim mastery of it. It's a weird thing, but we get it a lot. We, we certainly get it along, you know, amb ambitious musicians. I'm going to master every world instrument. I'm going to do this or that. And they, by removing it from the culture and then determining or creating a, a form of mastery or a definition of mastery that's perhaps completely different than its original context. So educators like um, at every level 
it's really something that we've been kind of ingrained with is like you go to a workshop well what can I take home what's that like you know you do your workshop what can I package up and do for a lesson on Monday and so that that's ingrained in us right from the beginning I think and um, you know when you're taught a song you're doing it for a performance you're doing it for a thing and it's not just the experience itself and I think that that feeds into that extractionist piece right like we we can't just be in a song or be in a place we have to like take it and what can I do with this later but also Gerard I was thinking about identity and I mean I agree with Deanna too that there's a couple conversations happening here with regard to the space between because identity too um, I don't know Homi Baba did a lot of research and work around identity in third space and how people of different cultures and he was primarily looking at indigenous and settler peoples and how there's a, a new identity that comes when you have a mixing of, of the peoples. I have an identity that because I actually didn't mention much about my 30 years of knowledge of Anishinaabe teachings and I, I can't even erase that from what I know and um, some elders just say accept that you know it Kelly. <laughs> Um, and so that's part of my identity too. And yet I realize I have this settler heritage in there too. And so I think a lot of us walk with those um, conflicting identities, but in a way they may actually help us to see in between the spaces, you know, and to negotiate them in, in different ways. And I love it that you said entering this space be in between um, is actually like an action piece or activism. So entering into an ethical space, um, it requires a doing. Okay, it's not about just learning and uh, becoming more informed, but actually a, a doing. And I really think that's where things are at right now with Black Lives Matters, with the Indigenous peoples um, in protecting their lands and, and Indigenous rights is, is that they're not standing on the wayside, they're doing. And, a, and as settler peoples, you know, maybe our question to ourselves is, is what are we doing? Because we're all in the nations where we're from, you know, where we might call home, can we just be passive, passive recipients of our lives? Is that privilege? And maybe we need to move from the privilege to build equitable and just relations. If you were to speak to field of community music as it is today, whatever that means, wherever context you're working from, you know, what's, what's the, what's the thing that you want people to hear right now? A question for community music activities and just a general community music um, in these organizations, particularly is, is as a, as a, as a dynamic group, is it a culturally space, safe space for Indigenous people to participate in and tell these stories? So my question would be to the wider community of, um, because you know, there's no universal indigenous, we are all at different stages um, and we're all decolonizing in different ways. Is it, is it a safe space? So we have to ask ourselves that. Settler peoples really are not used to not knowing. The, you know, life operates according to, their, to the ways they know the, the way of society should be. It, it just is a natural way of knowing and they haven't had to feel uncomfortable about being in situations of not knowing. So I guess my thought for them um, is uh, risk not knowing. And, uh, and I think that could be awesome for part singing partnerships or um, other singing arrangements is kind of venturing and discovering as, as we go. Can we create practices that are truly open and compassionate? I'd like to use the word anti-racist, but I don't know if that's the right word right but come up with that language of and then actually form practical practices not just standpoints or positions that's easy to do and i think in our world most of us don't actually believe most of the words that are coming to us now um, we question them but when people have long-term practices of allyship or collaboration or supporting one another that speaks volumes and could creating those safe spaces i think could come out of some pretty well-intentioned and um, uh, well-done, well-carried-out 
practices with all the mistakes that comes with practice. My call to action, I think, would be for non-Indigenous peoples to look inwards and to do the work on yourselves before trying to do collaborations. Um, because I think if you don't have your, if you haven't done your homework, if you haven't done your reading and your courses and you're listening to podcasts and you're all of the things that you can do to at least begin to kind of unlearn what you thought you knew, then you're not going to be entering into collaboration in a way that's going to be helpful to both sides. So I think, you know, being mindful of the burden that we're putting on um, Indigenous populations as this need um, and this want and this desire to be better allies uh, is so uh, present of mine right now that we need to really be conscious as well of the burden that we're placing on these communities. That there's a balance to be struck perhaps between the um, recognition of, of what you don't know and seeking out that knowledge, not from your collaborators, but, but through what is available um, and already out there that you could read and engage with um, or listen to. But um, what, what's the point at which you also need to act um, and not let yourself be paralyzed by what you don't know? Because I do agree with you, you can feel paralyzed or maybe isolated if you're only interpreting yourself and you lose the ambition or motivation to read. And so I think working with others, um, you know, to sort some of that out can be really helpful. But it's just, if we're thinking about action, then we have, then we probably need to think about the paralysis that can come from uncertainty. I actually really liked as well something, somebody, maybe it was Deanna who said earlier about being able to continue showing up. Right. Probably yeah. action. Well, I think I'm sorry, I'm just mindful of time, but certainly one thing we have a conversation about here is that people feel like they can't say something or they shouldn't say something. And I always respond with, well, that's a good thing because for much of your life, you've said too much too soon without any evidence and assumed that you're right. And, you know, you, <laughs> it's actually, I'm relieved when you actually pause, stop and consider. That's not a bad thing. And so it depends what the paralysis looks like, I guess, for me. <laughs> uh, for us in our language, we have this, and it's interesting, we have many different values, but one of the key ones is manakitanga, which is interesting enough, uh, for Lee Higgins is watching, is means hospitality. And, um, you know, we, we, have a, we have a responsibility to everyone, including settlers in this country. We don't call them settlers, we call them guests because they arrived after us. And we take care of our settlers, guests, but we take care of everyone who's come into this country since there. And this is one of the ways we would express hospitality is by guiding them through that process of feeling par um, paralyzed and sharing with them. I, I, but I love that sense of care yeah. too. At the, and it does, it changes the whole narrative, which is, which is why these cultural narratives, our narratives need to come in because they change the whole public narrative. And, it, you know, in always positive ways. The colonization through the intervention model of community music um, is something that I feel like it's time to it's time to push back on that, and it's time to recognize that um, yeah. that there is that that has a very particular model that comes from a a, a, a country that that has colonized, colonized a number of countries around the world. Yeah. I I hope that the conversation we're having today actually pulls those out and that we, we're, we're, we're finally naming them and, and recognizing actually there's lots of ways that community and music intersect um, in ways that, that could make a, a meaningful difference but also shift the power relationships. So, um, you know, one of those things that I think the intervention model links to the professionalization of community music. So I, I think it's interesting that there's, there could well be a connection between those two things as well because of course one of the ways you can justify and legitimize your work is if you are positioned slightly at a distance from those you will work on or with, yeah, yeah. which supports the professional structures, the structures that say this, these are, there are boundaries around this, you know. Um, which is the opposite yeah, of all Indigenous different. methodologies. Wow, I knew this was happening. 9.30, the conversation gets interesting. I mean, it's been interesting all along. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm just wondering how you're going to cut this down, Deanna. I know that the director's <laughs> cut podcast is like two hours long. <laughs> you know, it's everybody in advance. Like you just have to watch the full two hours and check in and we'll have the conversation. I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you That's all. Nice. Beautiful. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you're you very beautiful. much. Yeah. And we'll see you soon. Thank you for your song, <gasps> Kelly. Yeah. Beautiful, yeah. Kelly. Yeah. Beautiful. And all right. We'll be in touch soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.